Okay, yeah, um, I was talking about recuration of microscopic slides. So obviously this is a substantial time investment because actually dealing with these slides at this point in time, I don't really know what I'm talking about yet, but we will start a project where we, we don't have to recurate um, microscopic slides, but we will have to make a large number of slides. And we're gonna be, we're organizing a workshop where we have people in who've done that for a long time and they're going to be training my grad students and me how to do that. But it's a time consuming thing. It's not that, uh, it's not that expensive in terms of the actual materials. Okay, and one of the things too, when people do these recurations of microscopic slides, they would attach a unique specimen identifier, some kind of a barcode on, this, um, on that microscopic slide as well. Okay, one of the things actually they did here I think is bad, and I would never do that. So in certain cases, I think they removed the original labels because they felt they didn't really have enough information on them, and they typed the information and put it in a more standard format. What I would do in cases like that, I would not ever disconnect the original labels. I would put them on the, on the backside of the microscopic slides. But obviously, this is one of the constraints with microscope slides. There's only so little space on them. And I actually did have issues. I was just, you know, in, um, just before Christmas, I imaged a relatively large number of important microscopic slides for one of our research projects. And it was difficult in some cases to actually find a spot where I could put that barcode on it even. So there's, you know, challenges there. Okay, that, um, that project I was talking about where um, a lot of recuration happened in our institution was um, a project focusing on Aphytis, those are really super tiny, and I'm saying they're less than a millimeter, most of them, like much less than a millimeter. Um, parasitic wasps, and you might go like, well, why would you worry about you know, recurating a collection like that, it's just tiny little wasps. But one of the things the University of California, Riverside, the entomology department is really famous for and really well known for is classical biological control, essentially. The idea of biological control was actually originated from our university and we had a very, very strong, still have um, a very strong program in that area. So as part of these biological control projects, these tiny little wasps are being used to control all sorts of pests. And then um, Rosen and the Buck wrote a big monograph, a big revision of that entire group. So a lot of the slides we have in our collection are really, really important for taxonomic reasons, but and also for voucher reasons. So in a case like that for a designated project, that was actually fairly straightforward. That was before my time in Riverside, but it was very straightforward to get money for something that you can m make people understand that this is really important, that a collection doesn't deteriorate further. Okay, so what about fluid preserved specimens? And when I talk about fluid preserved specimens in the insect world, this is really either ethanol, and ethanol can range all the way from 70% for older um, um, collected specimens up to DNA quality material that we usually um, keep at between 95 and 99% uh, of ethanol if possible. But then also other, um, other collections, and it's a bit of a special case really, you find preserved in glycerol. So it's kind of gooey stuff that is really obnoxious to handle. It's not, you know, it's not poisonous or dangerous or anything, it's just very gooey and it sticks to your fingers and it's, it's obnoxious. Okay, so one of the important things with these fluid preserved collections is obviously, you know, they're in the fluid, so they are preserved in certain ways that couldn't be done when they were pinned, dried or something like that. Um, so you really have to make sure that the fluid stays in there. So all the big museums do regular fluid checks on all their spirit collections and then they check the level and if it needs to be refilled, they top it up, obviously. So for our purposes, it's a little bit easier because we store the, the specimens, the ethanol specimens that we have. They're mostly for DNA studies, so they're tissue collections essentially, and they're sitting in freezers, minus, I, minus 80 freezers typically, really. So evaporation there is still a concern, but much less of a concern, obviously. And this is one of these more specialized examples of um, specimens that were preserved, and so we call that thing a genitalic vial that's typically used when you do dissect an insect for taxonomic purposes. 
and you would have the insect sitting on a pin and the body parts you took off, you dissected, which is something you might have to do in order to identify it, for example. Then you stick the, those genitalic dissections typically into that vial together with glycerin and put it on a pin. So you're not disconnecting the specimen from its body parts. So in this case, the, um, the specimens that, is, that um, person Michael Emsley worked on in the 1960s, the specimen itself is tiny like that. So the genitalic vial is something like that, so it's not, it's not a big you know, vial. And then the specimen is really you know, a millimeter long or something like that. So he apparently decided it was going to be a good idea to keep these specimens in glycerol because they're certain, you know, they're easier to handle um, afterwards for morphological studies when they're not dried and, and cases like that when they're so tiny. So he did that and then I came uh, to the American Museum just before Christmas because I not only wanted to image the microscopic slides but I also wanted to image very important specimens. Here you're seeing this is a paratype. The holotype is deposited somewhere else where I can't access it as easily. And in certain cases, even the holotypes are sitting in these um, glycerol vials, so the genitalic vials. So I started opening up the first one and I had to realize that what had glycerol in it in 1969 obviously was completely dry. And it was a bit of a shock and I'm, we're still debating on how to best um, curate and remedy the situation. The problem there was also that some of these specimens are dissected, so it's not even just one millimeter long specimen sitting in there but it might be six or seven pieces of, there's a separate wing, there's a separate leg, there's the abdomen ripped off and things like that, so it's a mess. So check on your collections <laughs> and make sure um, that they are, if they're preserved in fluid that you can you know, figure out ways of getting the appropriate medium to top them off. Okay, then similar to what we said about a microscopic slice, typically when we curate these um, for example, the glycerol, the micro, uh, microscopic slide collections, we attach the unique specimen identifiers as we go. In this case, it's fairly simple because it really works like an insect pin. You just stick the, um, the barcode label on the, as the bottom most um, label on the pin. Okay, another important thing is obviously specimen labels. So when we go in the field, this is what it looks like. I have little handwritten labels. In this case, it says Peru, blah, blah, blah was collected then and then by those people and then obviously it also has all sorts of little cryptic things on there that really only mean something to me. YPT stands for yellow pan trap is one of our trapping techniques and 10 means 10 and then I have another field code below there. So with a label like that you can at least say okay I know where it's from, I have the locality information, I have the georeference and all the core data are there. But then this is what you're being confronted with in many cases as well. So here obviously the, um, the field people were very, very efficient. They didn't want to waste any time and you know, writing their um, more extensive field labels. So they really only have uh, one collection code for that particular trip. So then obviously I have to find out when I'm, in this case it was a relatively big collection of unsorted material that was shipped to us and then we have to go back to the people who give us that material and say, hey, do you have an electronic file that tells me really what that code means? And in many cases people will actually have by now electronic files where they have their locality information typed up. Because in the end, obviously, you want to have something like that that looks, you know, standardized and pretty. And one thing, and this is something at least the arthropod people are going to be seeing um, this afternoon as well, you're collecting in, let's say, in my case, in California. So I understand that it will be important to put the locality, which is a very long locality, I would never write anything like that, so this label is not my fault. <laughs> Um, you have the exact locality on there, you have the county in there as well, and then we're in California. And you go, everyone knows where California is, right? So, you know, why would I put the country on it? But if you start looking at other collections and areas that you're not that familiar with, it is actually really important to include the country into these labels as well, which is something when you go to older collections, this is something you really rarely see, but it helps you to, you know, it helps to speed up the entire data entry process in a long time, obviously. 
Okay, when I say um, typically we have, um, I, I call that a doc collection of locality labels. It could also be an Excel spreadsheet format or whatever. It could even be part of your database that you can output um, labels. This happens in this case, for example. So we put our field localities and the collection dates into the database before we even process specimens. And then we can print them out of the database directly. But then also a very simple Excel spreadsheet works really well. So you type up all the collections and then um, you store that in a safe place and you can sh share it with your colleagues. Um, or some people have Excel spreadsheets really. So very useful, very important. And it just helps with the overall data entry. Okay, specimen identification, of course. You know, entomologists have to talk about it just because it's a real big problem for us. So those are pictures from a few collections I went through over the last um, six months working on specific projects, really. So that was during a visit in, in Prague. So this was really actually not part of their collection. Those are specimens that were shipped. They're on loan to a colleague there. So they haven't been really curated in, in any sense yet, other than that they all belong to one order of insects and one suborder, but this is it. Obviously something like that you wouldn't, you wouldn't touch for digitization purposes. Then you might have cases where things have been, specimens have been sorted. So a specimen, someone, who knows, Hemiptera, Heteroptera well enough, went through a bunch of incoming um, specimens and kind of sorted out all the 86 different families. And this is something, it sounds overwhelming, but it's actually something that a lot of people in entomological collections learn how to do, to actually recognize all the different families in the great majority of orders, I want to say. So this is something that can actually be done quite well by even you know, more senior undergrad students or graduate students. This is what we, you know, what we have them do when we have them on what we call museum duty. All our grad students have to work in a museum for, for a little while and help out there essentially. Okay, then you can have things like that. Um, it's sort of a mixed pot here. Certain of these specimens are identified to subfamily, for example. Some of them have, and you can't really read that. There's a genus name up here, and then it says CF, and then a species epithet, and it really means, I think this is the species it is, but I'm actually not quite sure. So I put the CF, that might means to be confirmed, essentially. And, you know, you do, you do find that in collections a fair bit. And, you know, someone thinks in order to make a really good identification, I really would have to sit down and work on that particular group and study it more, um, more intimately, really, to make a real call on that. And then, obviously, this is in yellow because this is what we want to see, and this is what we see way too rarely, which is specimen identified to species, you know, this entire species sitting in its own unit tray, it even has a beautiful little label on the side, not only the handwritten one on the specimen, but this says this is this and that species, and then it's all properly labeled and nicely curated. In this case, obviously, they are types, so you would expect them to look decent. <laughs> okay, so the question is, how do you get from that classified to suborder, if you're lucky, to species identification? And as I said before, it's really, it's a long process, obviously. Again, there's no silver bullet, but just from our experience, a few tips, I think, of um, what I would try to do, really, to, to get a better curated collection in that sense. So one of the important things is if you have the staff and the knowledge yourself to classify to a certain level, that's a huge first step. So you want to go through new accessions and separate them out by order, separate them by suborder, maybe classify them to family or whatever level you can deal with. Then the other thing, and this is working, um, I would say, really quite well in, um, in a good number of collections in North America where it's really important to promote the collection to the specialists and experts out there. So I was telling people as part of the Entomological Collections Network, there's colleagues coming to these meetings from places like, we had a speaker from Honduras a couple of years ago. So he came in, he talked about the insect collection at Samarano, which is the Agricultural University in Honduras, and people were really excited about it. And as because of you know, him interacting with the people out there, there was a whole bunch of, of entomologists who actually came to visit in Honduras. We didn't really only go to the collection 
and um, spent a lot of time in the collection. We also went collecting, but still there was some curation that really happened in a collection that's very valuable. 